Dear respected Thai, dear beloved community, dear Sangha, Thai is the Vietnamese word for teacher and it's the traditional greeting um, that we basically use before saying anything <laughs> in the Plum Village tradition. And so uh, I'm specifically saying this to connect to my teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, but also to all the ancestors of teachers back in time to the Buddha. It's also an invitation to welcome all your teachers, all the lineages and streams that each of you carry, that we all carry, to welcome the ancestors of the land, the Lenape people, whose home has been forcefully shared, but we can learn to live it and walk on it with a little more respect, hopefully through the practice. And to remember that we're all students and teachers so I welcome all the students and teachers and all of you and all of me and we get to practice here this afternoon as we continue this day of mindfulness. My name is Sister Ocean or Hai Un in Vietnamese, same name. And so Brother Man is to my left, you got to meet him earlier, Brother Phat Vu. Uh, to my right, we're all ordained in the Plum Village tradition. Uh, we're all ordained in France and at other points we all uh, lived at Blue Cliff Monastery just a few hours from here, um, which is how we know each other. We've all left the formal monastery system, so we're forging a different path, which um, brings us deeply in connection with <laughs> Buddhist insights, also forging a different path. So it's such a joyous time to be here together, and also Ayachanda and other uh, Ayasuchita, who uh, just is a, such a feel so auspicious to be here together today um, at the beginning of this new continuation of Dharma practice and Buddhist insight. So thank you so much for the welcome and invitation. Thank you everyone for coming <laughs> as, as things are getting sorted out. <laughs> How to get 80 people into one bathroom. <laughs> one by one. <laughs> um, so thank you for the beauty of your practice already. It's very strong, very touching. Mm, today we get to explore the topic of self-compassion. Um, so needed, so important, and often so misunderstood. <laughs> um, so I want to start with a, a short quote from uh, the, the Pali Canon. Uh, just as the ocean has a single taste, that of salt, in the same way this Dhamma and Vinaya, which is the monastic training, has a single taste, that of release or freedom from dissatisfaction, stress, suffering. So all the teachings offered are to this one aim, this one reason understanding and transforming suffering. And so much of the Buddha's foundational teachings are amazing at dissecting dukkha or, or dissatisfaction and suffering. They really help us understand it, to overcome it. And I understand compassion as the energy or the motivation that makes us want to transcend suffering. So the two cannot be separate. Um, so we're going to dive into compassion and self-compassion today, but just know that it's part of this whole, it's the energy that fuels the whole path in a way. Um, and for those of us, especially in the Mahayana tradition or background, um, specifically wisdom and compassion are seen as the two wings of the bodhisattva path, the, um, the way we awaken. And there's, you know, hundreds of versions of the Buddha's path is this, this, this. So. One version is wisdom and compassion, and holding that as our foundation for exploring compassion today. Karuna is the <clears throat> Pali and Sanskrit word that gets translated into compassion. Um, remembering that all these teachings come through many layers and ages of translation, it's important to remember to unpack our words. Um, our teacher, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, explains compassion as simply the intention 
and capacity to relieve and transform suffering and lighten sorrows. Um, Mark Coleman, an insight teacher, gives this um, explanation I really appreciate. Compassion doesn't flee from pain or try to judge or get rid of it. It's simply there with a strong, kind presence. And when we have access to this heartfulness, the critic loses so much of its influence over us. So compassion as a state of heartfulness, I think of it almost as a freedom from the fear of suffering. That's what allows us to go in to transform suffering because when we're afraid of it and reacting to it, we're always fleeing and fixing and numbing out, right? So, so there's a lot that's required to even be able to really explore compassion because so many of our habits and our ner nervous system is really designed to get us out. <laughs> but there's so much freedom and value that comes when we actually learn a different way to stay present and actually find that there's not so much to be afraid of. Sometimes there's nothing at all to be afraid of uh, once we shift our perspective. Father Greg Boyle is a Jesuit priest out in LA who is a founder of Homeboy Industries, the largest gang intervention program in the world, and um, beautiful teacher. He explains compassion as not a relationship between the healer and the wounded, but it's a covenant between equals. And in the Dharma sense, we don't even need to use the word equals because <laughs> uh, we don't even need to see a separate self, but it's, this, it's, it's our interrelatedness manifesting itself in the realm of relieving suffering. Compa he continues to say, compassion is always at its most authentic about a shift from the cramped world of self-preoccupation into a more expansive place of fellowship and true kinship. Sometimes I cry when I read that. It moves my heart so much. That shift from self-preoccupation into the expansive space of fellowship, of kinship, of connection. Because when we're blocked from compassion, when we're blocked from connection, our world, our lives become cramped, right? And so just the, the, this very fundamental recognition of like, oh, when my heart can't feel a sense of care for another's pain, I'm in a place of pain because I'm stuck in my self-preoccupation cramped space. And that's not even a judgment, it's just a <laughs> noticing. This is what's happening right now. And we need to have this foundation in a practice of compassion because if we don't know where we're starting from, <laughs> it's very hard to get anywhere else. Um, I'm going to mention a little bit about the Brahma Viharas, the four immeasurable minds or the four divine abodes four types of love at near the end of the talk, but a lot of people have probably heard of metta as a practice. Has anyone heard of metta or done metta practice? Um, so some folks here, not everyone. Um, it speaks to the loving kindness, the connecting aspect of these qualities of love. And it's, um, you can think of it as like the friendliness that like, oh, I care about you, connection. And compassion is very simple, similar because it is that connection, but it's specifically in the direction of concern about suffering and wanting to relieve it or acting to relieve it. There's an active aspect of compassion. Um, I like to look a little bit at neurobiology and, and modern psychology and you know, there's sometimes I hear the phrase compassion fatigue tossed around and I think it's really important in Dharma circles to clarify that the compassion that the Buddha taught and that we're learning to cultivate here does not fatigue itself. It is the antidote to the fatigue that gets called compassion fatigue and so I appreciate that um, researchers now are using the umbrella term of empathy as all the ways that we resonate with each other's experiences and then differentiating that empathetic distress is one type 
of empathetic connection, and then compassionate resonance is another form of empathetic connection, and they're very, very different even on a brain level. Um, so when empathetic distress comes up, um, the thought patterns become very, again, self-preoccupied, attached to a separate sense of self and, and maybe a fear or a self-protection um, in a way that actually um, feels really unpleasant. It lowers our immune system. It ups the heart rate. It has a whole host of negative physiological effects that, that come up. Um, and it leads to withdrawal from the world and other beings. Whereas compassionate resonance is even seen on a physiological level to be a different, different place in the brain that lights up, a different reaction that's happening where there is a lessening of self-preoccupation and a softening of the sense of personal boundary. There is a grounded kind of leaning in to connect to the other without a defensiveness and it actually increases health and vitality. There is, even in the face of the discomfort of the suffering, there's also a joy of the connectedness. Does that make sense? So, so you know, there are moments we're gonna find ourselves in empathetic distress, and like I said, it's not to judge, it's to go, oh, this is what's happening right now. This is actually a form of suffering that that is worthy of receiving true compassion. <laughs> because so often when we find ourselves in empathetic distress, it's like we think we're doing something that's necessary and that we have to help somebody or, or to keep going with it, right? But keep going with it is actually just adding to the suffering. And so learning to recognize it and go, wait a minute, what's going on now? Is such a key, key component in a practice of them <coughs> being able to generate the compassion that the Buddha is, is speaking of. And I, I truly believe most of the great sages of all traditions understood this and try, taught it in their own ways. Can you give an example? Of what? Of okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna give a few specifics <laughs> um, with the topic, what blocks compassion? So variations on empathetic distress. So. Um, Trying to think if I have anything personal recently. Fortunately, I can't think of anything recent, but um, certainly whether it's, I know I've had so many times of you know picking up a newspaper and reading a story about folks I either know or don't know who are you know f have f facing um, war and famine and. A situation where I notice there's suffering here but my my system starts just feels really overcharged I get really worried I my brain starts spinning and like I want to do something I don't know what to do there's sort of this shutdown that happens mm -hmm. or overwhelm and and often there's a lot of mental discourse that happens of like what can I do how can I change it? I don't know what I can do I don't know if I can do anything I'm powerless or you know all these things it is a moment of touching into the suffering, but then it's spinning out in the internal fear of the suffering, not knowing what to do with it, because it feels overwhelming. I mean, it's suffering. It's unpleasant. There's a reason our nervous systems are designed to, to pull back. You know, when you touch a hot stove, it's good that our hands pull back. But emotionally, we're wired the same way so that when we come into contact with suffering, there's this like, oh no, get away. And sometimes that's wise, but sometimes that actually just makes it keep going. And so that's what this is really breaking down. You know, um, I'm gonna give a lot of examples in regards to other people and then bring it back to self because it's a little easier to understand like that. Um, you know, and my in mom same and- the situation, what would compassion be? Like? Yeah, um, so I, I mean, I do this all the time is like, whether it's seeing a headline or you know a friend calls in distress, yeah. um, and I find it's really helpful to ground. Like I'll actually feel my feet, on, pay attention to my feet on the ground, or put a hand on my belly or on my heart, like to to, to help my mind or to help the attention stay grounded somewhere. And I breathe into my heart, and sometimes I'll even say a little inner phrase of like, "There's so much suffering here." 
or just a simple like there is suffering here when I hear sirens that's always what I do I take a pause and go oh there's suffering here may it be relieved whether I know how to do it or not, whether I can be part of it or not, but shift the energy to a space that's like acknowledging the reality of it as opposed to the kind of trying to get away and then setting an intention in a positive direction, <coughs> whether I know how to do that or not, but um, just tr that turning. Um, and often I ha I, it's not until I recognize my body kind of seizing up. I'm like, oh, I'm in distress. I didn't realize it. Okay switch focus, feet on the ground, <laughs> or sometimes even just like look up and out to get a bigger perspective. Um, I'm going to talk a bit also about some formal practices that have been offered because training in this kind of compassion in a formal set way can help it come up spontaneously in daily life. Um, and there's so I wanted to just name that, you know, often the empathetic distress or any type of overwhelm around being in touch with suffering, and again, I'm going to focus on others and then turn it inwards, um, often either goes to numbness, so we don't even know we're blocking it out. <laughs> it's so habitual. We've been conditioned by society to distract and numb through drugs and alcohol, through TV, through mindless conversations, through busyness, through workaholism. Like so many ways we're conditioned to just numb out. Um, or else the, like, the way, of the overwhelm where we actually feel that this feels awful. Um, those are two sort of sides of actually a similar inner response. It just feels very different. Um, So I'm actually going to give the exercises at the end. I'm changing the order. Um, because all of the Buddha's teachings are offered in a container that is connected to many other teachings. So mindfulness is part of an eightfold path. It's never meant to just <laughs> be a standalone. Um, it's connected to teachings on ethic and, and generosity, of cultivating wisdom, and we call it a right view, a different way of understanding how the world works. Um, so compassion is offered in this realm of the four Brahma Viharas, Brahma being a heavenly being, or, uh, and Vihara being dwelling. So um, how does one dwell in a heavenly place or a divine place? Uh, we don't need to wait and die and go somewhere else when the mind is suffused with kindness, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity, we are here and now in a divine abode. So that's the, where the name came from. Um, and they're offered together because they balance each other out perfectly. Compassion is the type of love or connection that leans in and seeks to act to relieve suffering. But mudita, appreciative joy, specifically leans in to celebrate in the goodness and joy and good fortune of others. So we're not just paying attention to what's going wrong in the world and in our families. We're really paying attention, learning to pay attention to what's going well and celebrating what's going well, which sounds like it might be easier, but for a lot of people, it brings up all the seeds of envy and jealousy. And sometimes it's even harder to learn to celebrate in the goodness of others. So these are really deep heart practices. And if they sound light and fluffy, practice it for a few weeks or years and you'll find the depths of the challenges. And then the, what's often listed as the first metta or loving kindness and the last of equanimity, I see those as like the, the big containers. This is just how I understand it and practice with it. Always checking in that there's a general sense of connection and letting go. I can't control what's happening to other people. I can, you know, make a few action gestures. I can set good intentions. I can say kind words. I can try to do a few things, but I cannot control someone else's whole life path. Even parents cannot control the outcome of their children's lives, right? I think you all know this, the challenge of this one better, better than anyone. And yet that's not a reason to disconnect. 
<laughs> we both connect and let go. That's the constant koan or challenge. And then very specifically in my um, interrelational, uh, interpersonal relations, I check in. And even in regards to the world, am I paying attention to the joy and the sorrow somewhat equally? <laughs> it's so easy to just pay attention to what's going wrong, to where the pain is. Although for some people, they're really good at tuning that out and they just pay attention to what's going well. And so the Buddha offers all these practices and we can learn over time. Where am I at right now? How can I balance myself? And especially if we are prone to empathetic distress, this teaching is an invitation to like, okay, if you're gonna read the news, spend twice as much time playing with your grandkids or petting the cat or doing a, a Brahma Vihara meditation, <laughs> like intentionally be aware of what you're ingesting, where's your balance, because our capacity to stay engaged in the world and caring for ourselves is actually very important. It's not just a, like, a self-centered, inward, feel-good, tune everything out practice is actually really essential for the well-being of our planet. Um, so there's four, there's phrases that I found so beautiful from Carolyn Jones and Paul Burroughs, English insight teachers. Um, I just find it poetic and so insightful to explain how these all work together in a more of a circu circular way. Metta is the kindness or the love that connects. It is an antidote to all forms of aversion or hatred. And it's not attachment, it's a type of love that is completely unattached. But if it slides into sentimentality, then karuna or compassion brings the heart back into balance. <coughs> karuna is the love that responds. It's an antidote to cruelty and it is not pity, even if it looks like it. <laughs> if karuna or compassion slides into sorrow or overwhelm, then mudita, appreciative joy, brings the heart back into balance. Mudita is the love that celebrates. It's the antidote to envy. And it's not competitive at all. If it slides into an agitated excitement, then upeka or equanimity brings the heart back into balance. Upeka is the love that allows, <coughs> and it's the antidote to partiality. It's not indifference. But if it slides into disconnection, then metta brings the heart back into balance. So I often keep these four in the back of my mind. Any moment that I notice myself feeling stressed or tense or out of sorts or, yeah, off in any way, I check, where am I at with the four Brahma Viharas? Am I paying a little too much attention to the suffering? Or am I caught up in excitement and agitation and could just <laughs> do with a little bit of the settled kind of celebration? Am I attached to outcomes and really trying to make things a certain way? Can I open my hands a little bit? And each person at different times and different situations will probably find a different balancing method. So this isn't like a learn the one, two, three, four, and like our brother said, just keep it in the mind. And there we go, I have the analysis and I've memorized the phrases, I'm done. It doesn't work like that, um, but it's a constant invitation to ask, what's happening right now? And then experiment, you know? You could, if you're feeling that you're really experiencing a lot of overwhelm, you could try specifically doing a mudita practice of like, okay, how am I, I'm gonna celebrate. Um, celebrate good things. I'm gonna give myself 10 minutes every day that I specifically do that. And then after a few weeks, notice, What's that impact been in my life, in my mind? Am I more able to connect to the suffering in the world when I'm balancing with that? 
or maybe um, maybe something else will help. Maybe you need more equanimity, more remembering, I'm not in charge here. <laughs> my best efforts cannot control the world and certainly cannot control my loved ones or my boss. Um, you know, we do our best and we let go. Um, so checking in on these four, even just like, you know, literally 30 seconds, 10 seconds every now and then, um, can be really phenomenal. Um, and just to, to nuance compassion a little bit more before we're going to do a short meditation. Um, yeah, this, this compassion energy comes, I mean, we could say it's from the heart, but I want to say it's like it's from the whole body. It's even bigger than the body and a sense of self because if we go really deeply into compassion, we get to all the four Brahma Viharas, we get into such a state of connection that the difference between me and you softens and maybe doesn't even matter so much anymore. Um, yeah. In these phrases, um, it wasn't stated specifically, but the Buddha gave teachings around what are called the near and far enemies. Um, things that look like and could easily be mistaken with the quality we're actually looking to cultivate. So with compassion, pity is the near enemy, that's, that's the term. Because pity is I'm here and feeling bad about you over there, but I'm not leaning in to do anything. Even if, even if you know, even someone might be writing a check <laughs> to donate to an organization, but there's this like, oh, too bad for them. I just don't want to think about it, you know, and, and the thing is the heart does that. So even that, like if that's where you find yourself or that's where you find someone you know, that kind of state is happening, that's just something to be seen. Oh, okay, this is a state of suffering. This is a state of contraction. Um, and maybe offering that person a bit of compassion in the heart. Um, but it's, it's not the quality that we're looking to create more of. <laughs> that we're not looking to intentionally generate. Um, whereas ill will or, or um, cruelty, like wanting to do harm to someone else, is the actual opposite of, of compassion. And so sometimes we can think of compassion as the absence of cruelty. That's another way of looking at it. I know at least in Burma and maybe some other places, metta or the loving kindness is actually... Um, said to be, or the word used for is non-ill will. And I like how the Buddha's phrases often bring us into these negations, you know? The third noble truth being the cessation of suffering. Well, what does that mean? I mean, we could have ideas, but the fact that it's a negation for me leaves it actively something to explore, to get curious about. So what's non-cruelty. I'm not entirely sure, but I can explore. And in that curiosity, we engage more actively than thinking like, oh, I know what compassion is. I'm being compassionate now. Because it's really easy to delude ourselves <laughs> into thinking that our hearts are free when they aren't. <laughs> but curiosity is one aspect that we got to um, visit in the meditation this morning that pretty consistently takes at least a layer of delusion off, if not more. So these negations, I, I like to play with them as an invitation into curiosity of like, oh, what is happening right now? To get a little more present, a little clearer, a little less delusion, a little less dukkha. Um, so if it has been clear, the, this whole question of like, what is really compassion? It's about the energy, not the action, right? People ask, like, is this compassionate or is that kind? Like, well, can't really say. And the Buddha said a lot about the importance of intention. So the same goes for compassion. What's the intention in the heart? Is there a, a leaning in from a grounded place to try to relieve suffering? Then, yeah, good chance. That's something we want to keep cultivating. And you might practice this for five years and suddenly have a moment of realizing oh, wait a minute, I thought that, you know, when I was helping out my sister or taking care of the grandkids or 
volunteering here or you know taking part even in like political actions in one's community to stand up for a group that we're part of or a group that we want to support we can think that we're doing it from a really free place in the heart and then suddenly go oh wait a minute it was also completely twinged by trying to fix and trying to control but that doesn't need to be a reason to stop it's a moment of oh i understand more now i wonder if i can find a freer place in the heart to act from because sometimes in spiritual communities there can be a bit of like judging each other for not <laughs> being the most spiritually awakened in how we do things and that's not actually helping folks grow into wisdom and freedom but if it happens then we notice that's what's happening <laughs> and try to go oh can I find because any time that that we're not being compassionate towards another person, we're the first ones to suffer. That contraction, we might be used to it and not notice it. We may be so accustomed to numbing out and not feeling connected that it seems normal and we don't even recognize it as discomfort. But then the moment we get a taste of this expansiveness, then coming back to that old normal, then we can know, oh my gosh, you know, it's like you've been carrying a 25 pound backpack and you just do it all the time and you don't notice. You put it down, <sighs> wow. And I think that's what compassion is inviting us into all these teachings from the Buddha, into something that's subtle and it's a little hard to know off the bat because we're so used to our separation, we're so used to our disconnection, we're so used to a society that's cruel that treats people and animals and the planet as disposable, especially treats marginalized folks as disposable, poor people as disposable. So we get used to disconnection. But when we realize that's what's going on, we realize it hurts. Something feels bad about it. When our humanity, when our hearts are intact, Everyone knows how bad disconnection feels, cruelty feels. Kids know it right away. So this is some of the danger of compassion is that it'll start showing us the places we've been stuck and blocked and been used to, maybe bought into and pay, played into systems that we don't want to be part of. So this is where it's essential to know how to turn compassion in towards ourselves. Not beat ourselves up for it, but go, oh, this is a suffering I'm carrying. May I understand this suffering that I'm carrying. And may I find freedom from this, both for my inner experience and because it will ripple out without a doubt in how I live, how we all live and interact in the world. Because when we go fully into this, there is no you and no me. There is just suffering and the wish to relieve suffering. So it doesn't matter what direction it's going in. Up, down, all around, in, out. So ultimately, there's actually no difference between self-compassion and compassion for others. But if you need to start somewhere specific, one direction is probably easier than the other. So we're going to do a little bit and I'm, we're going to see how it goes. But this is the, the foundation it's being held in. So let your sitting posture be stable and comfortable. If you need to adjust, adjust. Listen to three sounds of the bell.
So we'll do a short guided compassion meditation. You're invited to call to mind someone that's easy to care for. A child, a pet, <laughs> a guidance counselor in high school who supported you when no one else did. It doesn't matter who it is, but someone that's easy to feel a sense of care for. You might want to visualize this person if, um, if that's a form of thought pattern that works for you. Or you can imagine yourself with the person or remember a time. But anything that sort of gets your heart feeling close to them in a, yeah. And so aware that this person that you care about so much has many joys and many sorrows in their lives. I'm going to repeat this phrase silently a few times and see if it can help open a sense of connection to caring about the suffering that this one you love is bound to experience, sometimes more, sometimes less. My friend, my loved one, I know your suffering is real. I care about your suffering. May you be safe and free from whatever suffering you face. And if it helps, you're always welcome to put a hand on your heart or your face or your arm if that helps awaken this sense of connection. Oh, honey, I know you suffer. I care about your suffering. And may you be safe and free from all the difficulties that you face. Because I really want you to be well. I know your suffering is real. It's as real as mine. I care about your suffering. May you be safe and free from all the difficulties I know you face, just like me. I know there's suffering here. May you be free, totally free from your difficulties and suffering. May you be at ease in body and in mind. I really wish you well. For the next minute, you can see if there's one phrase that resonates with you more than the others and repeat that silently, or if some sort of inner sense of connection has, been, has arisen, then you can just let that grow. And if there's numbness or disconnect or confusion, you can go back to following the breath.
And then if you wish in your heart, sort of saying a, I love you and goodbye for now to that being. I want you to shift attention to consider a group of people that you know are going through suffering, whether it's a group you're part of or not. And we're going to offer the same phrases silently. So just take a moment. You don't have to figure out the best or the forever group, just any group of people, group of beings even. It uh, doesn't have to be people, but living beings that you know <coughs> are experiencing suffering, at least some. And we'll offer these same phrases, whatever the reaction is, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Doesn't matter, just stay with it. <sighs> to this group of people I care about so much, I know your suffering is real. It's as real as mine. I care about your suffering. May you be safe and free from all your struggles and sorrows. I know your suffering is real. I care about your suffering. May you be safe and free from injury or anger, fear and anxiety, illness and danger. I know your suffering is as real for you as my suffering is real for me. I care that you suffer and I really want it to cease. May you be safe and free from all fear, anxiety, illness and danger. May you be at ease. May you find peace and wellness. either repeating a phrase that resonates with you or finding different wording or letting a feeling in the heart or body grow or returning to the breath And then bidding this group of beings a farewell for now. The third focus is to turn attention into one's own 
being. So directing the phrases towards oneself. I know that my suffering is real and I care about my suffering, the distress, discomforts, difficulties and hardships. It's okay to notice them and care about them. And may I find ease. May I be free from all delusion and suffering. I don't need to pretend there is no difficulty. I can recognize the suffering I experience. I know I need not fear the suffering I face. It's okay to take care of my suffering. And it's okay to wish myself freedom from suffering and even engage in practices to release all suffering. I know my suffering is real. I care about my suffering. May I be safe and free from injury, illness, and hardship. I just want you to notice what your experience is of this. We're actually going to pretty shortly move into a time for you to get to talk about this experience with each other, and then we're going to break it down in a group. But I just want to do some general check-ins. Um, who was new to a compassion meditation? Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> um, who noticed it easiest, if there was greater ease in one or the other? Oh, so who noticed um, if it was sort of a similar experience for all three categories? Did anyone have a similar experience? A few folks? So did the others find that one or two were easier than others? For those who found one or the other easier, did anyone find it easiest to focus on one person? Yeah. Did anyone find it easiest to focus on a group? A few. What about focusing on oneself? Did anyone find ease in focusing on oneself? A few. Did anyone find it really hard to send the phrases to oneself? Yes. Yeah. Hard to send it to a group? Hard to an individual, one or two. And who found the whole thing just like boring, ridiculous? <laughs> Your heart was just like, oh my God, finish. Totally fine. <laughs> okay, 
Maybe you don't even have to say it in front of everyone. Just know that that happens sometimes. I wouldn't say boring, but I had a question. Is it just enough to feel about somebody suffering? So yes, I wanted to. So that's that's why I want to sort of give some wrap up words, and then we're going to transition to the conversations, and then there's also going to be Q and A time with all of us. Um, but thank you. That's so important. Um, yeah, compassion isn't just about the feeling. Um, even this is. I mean, we don't need science to back up the Buddha's teachings, but I do find sometimes I get this like extra oomph of like, whoa, I didn't know that that could be seen like in brain scans. So even brain scans show that this type of compassion lights up your motor neurons, like it's actually directly connected to taking physical action because the just feeling very easily um, turns into passivity or powerlessness. Um, so it doesn't mean that we always take action because sometimes there are no actions that can be taken, but there's always this like, can I do something? Let me see. I want to, you know, not a I have to do something, but like, can I? Let me see. Yeah. Um, so especially if there is a sense of empathetic distress or a difficulty connecting to a sense of compassion for other people. Maybe compassion for oneself is what's needed. And don't even focus on the phrases for other beings. Or if the phrases for other beings is really easy, then we need to learn to cultivate it for ourselves. Because um, I find, especially like folks who've done a lot of caregiving um, or work in social services, teachers, especially mothers, but sometimes fathers and other parents and caregivers too, like can be so conditioned and so habituated to always take care of everyone else that even offering phrases of compassion to oneself can feel like something's wrong. <laughs> so it's really worthwhile. And if it feels uncomfortable, this is one of the good discomforts to go through. Like this is the discomfort of something has fallen asleep. <laughs> and as our leg is waking back up from falling asleep, it hurts, but that's a healthy kind of hurt. Um, and it's, it's not an overwhelm. It's a like, oh, this feels really weird. Like if you're right-handed and you try to eat with your left hand, that feels weird, but it's not dangerous. Important differentiation. Um, and if, if it's easy for you to sort of care about your own suffering, and it's hard to care about others, Doing something like this regularly, even just for five or ten minutes, either every day or maybe one dedicated period every week over a number of months can really transform that distinction of like who do who who's whose pain is worthy? <laughs> That's the question underneath it. And I just wanted to also explain in these phrases, the phrase, I know your suffering is real, in some ways that's kind of antithetical to the Buddha's teachings because <laughs> we don't want to be like grasping on and making a sense of some sort of suffering permanent. So if, if you notice that like, oh, there's just so much suffering, like, and it becomes sort of hard and it feels like a lump, focus on the joy. Like you don't need extra, <laughs> find a way to get more spaciousness. But there's such a human tendency, especially with others, but even towards ourselves to dismiss any just difficulty and be like, oh, just get over it. Oh, you should get like, that's so easy that a training that keeps like, no, don't turn away. Don't turn away. Oh, actually, I can open a little bit more. Oh, yeah, there is this tendency to care about my pain in the knee, but not care so much about your pain in the knee <laughs> because we're humans. You know, it's okay if we start there, but if we want freedom, it behooves us to learn. To, to expand a little bit more. Um, and so my shortcut for all these phrases is just to like, oh, there's suffering. May it release. Because it makes me like first check in and not fight it and not push it away, but then still move in that direction of release and freedom and letting it go. Because grasping onto it can be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I really appreciate Totally. Uh, which is the Tibetan practice, mm -hmm. of, like breathing in the suffering of other and breathing and, and exhaling compassion. Yeah. And that has really helped because 
Python to be very self-absorbed. And <laughs> during that sort of practice of like reading something about it and studying in Python mm -hmm. uh, has really helped me to like develop, you know, like I would like to think it has helped me now. Yeah. To develop compassion for others. I don't know how my friends think. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I want to just, I'm not going to take, thank you. And we're not, we're not going to open for, comments right now because you're all going to get to talk to each other so I want to give some instructions for that um, and then we're going to all come back and have open sharing questions with all of us and then we're going to have a final sit um, so I know that some folks need to go to the bathroom through dis the discussion time um, you're welcome to just come in and out as you need um, if you see someone come back go up so that we don't have to stop for an hour for everyone to get to use the bathroom. So please take care of yourself. Um, yeah, um, I love Tonglen practice. I'm just not trained in it. If I was, I would be teaching it all the time. Um, and especially like when I've been gone through serious illness and some other crises, like it made me see where all the blocks were <laughs> and and help to open it's it's phenomenal um so there's so many ways to access the same quality um so i'm imagining and hoping that you all have things to share and we don't have time for everyone to have a long sharing with everyone but we do have time to get into groups of threes so please just stay here i'll give the instructions and then i'm going to invite you to silently Find a group of three. Some people might want to go in the dining hall if you're warm enough in the in the shoe room, um, so that we can sit and each person will have um, four minutes. Person A shares for four minutes. Just what's this experience like? Where there were blocks, where you learned something, where repeat like doesn't matter. Any reflection. And if you really want to pass, you all can just sit there and quietly breathe together because we don't want to force people to talk. But we're going to give you four minutes to see if there's at least a few words you want to say. And the other two are just going to listen. And it might be tempting to want to say something or to plan your response. And then you just notice, oh, the mind wants to plan. The mind is wanting to respond. <coughs> and then shift back to just giving the gift of listening. Very few people receive that gift. Um, some people have never experienced it, so we want to make sure that everyone gets a little just listening. And then after four minutes, there'll be a sound of a bell, pause, listen, and then switch to the next person who will get four minutes, the other two listen. Last person gets four minutes, the other two listen, and then silently, we'll all come back. So we aren't breaking into chatter in between, even though we have to move around. And it's, again, it might feel uncomfortable, but the invitation is to let ourselves really stay with what this experience has been, as opposed to like, even jump into the distraction of chatting as much as connecting <coughs> with our neighbors can be really beautiful too. Does that sound clear enough? Mm -hmm. Clear as mud? Okay, so with the sound of the bell, let's, um, oh yeah, maybe one last sound of the, or three, three sounds of the okay. bell? Sure. Yeah.